Hello, everyone, and welcome to this session about robotic process automation and the hard learned lessons from the trenches. My name is Darko Evisic. I'm a CEO and co-founder of Robotic AI. We are an RPA platform producer from Croatia. And today I'm going to present the lessons we learned over the years deploying uh, this technology to multiple customers in multiple industries. And the lessons I'm going to share are not uh, particularly uh, tied to any platform or any vendor, but they're actually generic lessons that uh, we learned the hard way and which helped us really uh, the scale the projects that we are doing. So um, one of the things that um, uh, is uh, uh, symptomatic about RPA is that is maintenance heavy, meaning that somebody always has to monitor what the robots are doing. And very often there is a, a number of changes that need to be done on a, on a daily or weekly basis. Um, so to create kind of the deployment where the maintenance level, level is lower, uh, that depends on several factors. One is the quality of uh, business analysis, meaning uh, did you really uh, have uh, thorough talks with the uh, process owners, with all the people that are in charge of the process? And did you really dig, dig down deeply and extract all the business rules and, and, and what happens in the process? The next factor that really influences the level of maintenance is the quality of implementation. Because in RPA, you can achieve the same thing in multiple ways. And, and the way you implement the process will determine also the, the number of errors or how easy it is to maintain the, the whole process. And lastly, uh, it also uh, the influenced by quality of communication, because when you're working on RPA projects, there are multiple stakeholders that are involved. So uh, there is the implementator, there is the IT, there is the uh, the process owner department and the managers. So there are multiple lines of communication and how well you communicate and <clears throat> get feedback will also determine the level of maintenance that will be uh, later on. So I'm gonna dispense uh, several advices on, on how to, uh, to lower this maintenance. Some of them will be technical, some, some of them will be more on the business side but this is a, a list of things that we noticed throughout the years. Um, so the first uh, advice is uh, regarding the, the, the RPA is uh, that the robots mostly operate on user interface level, meaning that they are clicking through the applications and, and, and this is good, but also this can be cause of uh, problems uh, because you know the application can change, you, have, you can have like pop-ups appearing and multiple different stuff, and this can crash the robot. Uh, so it's better if you actually remove the robot from the, from the UI level and actually use uh, APIs. There are also many vendors support uh, kind of connectors to different uh, systems like SharePoint, databases, uh, SAP and others. And, and also to use database wherever you can uh, because you, you provide more efficiency and robustness to the robot. Uh, also, there are a lot of operations that can be automated in a non-user interface way. So uh, sometimes the easy way is to do it uh, through the application, but actually some things can be achieved without actually using the application. So just a few examples on what you can do. Uh, so one of the things that we often use is that instead of opening an Excel as a, as a visual application, we try to connect to Excel as a database, uh, meaning that uh, there is a all ADB or ODBC connector and you connect it as you would connect to Oracle or any other database and you can issue queries to, 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 to Excel. Now this uh, has several benefits. You can uh, issue the queries with multiple conditions so you can get the results much faster. You don't have to loop over the result set. And it's also more robust because you are not using uh, Excel ap application per se. Um, also, there's a possibility, for example, to generate uh, Word documents using a feature of uh, a Word called Custom XML, which can generate Word documents uh, without the need to actually open the Word and find and replace some uh, placeholders or something like that. So you, you can actually do it 
uh, without using the application and it works way, way, way more, more faster. Also, for example, you can uh, download SharePoint documents, not by opening SharePoint and navigating through to, to the document library, but actually you can attach uh, the document library as a network drive. So instead of opening browser and doing multiple steps, you can just, you know, uh, issue a simple uh, command prompt command such as copy or, or read document or something like that. So it's much more faster and it's much more robust. Uh, you know, converting uh, uh, Word documents to PDF instead of like opening Word and, and then clicking file, save as to PDF, you can actually do it through command line. And there are multiple examples where you can do stuff without using the application. Uh, and so the advice general here is to explore the ways that you can optimize the process uh, by using non-user uh, interface methods. So try to find uh, things that you can do in much more efficient way. And, you know, here the Google is your friend and there are, uh, you know, libraries and common prop or, uh, or uh, commands and so on. So you can do stuff much more faster and much more robust. The second advice uh, I want to share is regarding when you have a, a big chunk of work that needs to be done. Uh, so when you have a pile of requests that need to be entered in some application, let's say it's a couple of thousand. So the advice here is that uh, you want to isolate the, the, the units of work to the smallest level. Uh, so you want to isolate tr transactions. So, um, so it's contained in, in one process and when it fails, it fails only on one, on one unit of work. So I know it sounds complicated, but, it, but it's uh, actually quite uh, simple. So we'll take an example. So say that you have an Excel file with let's say 3000 records and your robot needs to read these 3000 records and enter them in some application. So the, the simple approach to this uh, um, request is that we build one process which reads this Excel file and then loops over these 3000 records and uh, enters them one by one. So what is the problem here is that if you implement it as a monolith process, uh, the problem could arise, let's say the robot enters 1000 correctly, but on 1001, the robot fails. Uh, so you, you've actually, um, you know, stop the process and now you need to go over again and then it will fail again on this uh, thousand and first uh, record. Um, so it's, it's not a good approach. The better approach is to build a kind of dispatcher worker pattern where you would have one process that would read uh, these 3000 records and generate 3000 tasks uh, each. So robot is taking one by one uh, these uh, tasks and, and then completing them. So what you get with this is actually you get isolated transactions. So if this record 1001 fails, it doesn't uh, actually stop the others uh, uh, in completion. And also you can prioritize the work. So for example, these 3000 records are not a high priority. So they can be entered like after work. So what you get with this, you know, that the robot can do like other processes and when it's idle, so when it's not working on anything else, uh, it can do like these uh, data entries. If you have one monolith process of 3000 records, and let's say it's one minute to enter a, a record, you would need to have the robot at disposal for 3000 minutes consecutively. So nothing else could work on the robot while these 3000 items are being entered. So this is also a problem. The cons of this approach is that it requires some extra development uh, because you need to, you know, uh, architect the process in such a way and it's a bit more complex. And also the speed of execution because uh, each time the, the robot needs to open the application and maybe pass the initial screens. So it will actually prolong the, the execution of the uh, these 3000, but I think the pros outweigh the actually the cons. Um, the next thing I want to talk about is the about the unattended robot. So if you are working with the server based uh, automation, so not desktop based automation, um, 
it's you know they're very hard to troubleshoot and and then to debug because uh, you actually it's a black box and and you actually don't see what happened there so there might be some pop-up that appeared uh, there is no stack trace on what went on uh, in this uh, in this uh, process so it's it's very hard to actually uh, understand what went on in the process so to simplify and speed up the process you could do uh, several things you can implement custom logging database or some local log files where you could actually uh, track these uh, things down. Also, you could uh, create a Word document or something like that uh, to capture uh, screenshots uh, that happened during the execution. And also, you could actually potentially even uh, create a video log of the, of the execution. So if something goes wrong, you can actually play a video and see what the robot done in the, in the, in the background. Um, also, one piece of advice when working with the unattended robots is not to use shared credentials. So user credentials, someone's employee's credentials when accessing applications, because you will not know what the robot did and what the employee did. So the advice there is to always use dedicated uh, robot credentials. Okay. So uh, the next advice is regarding the, the business rules and some configuration uh, parameters. So sometimes in the speed of uh, uh, development, we hard code business rules and technical configurations in the process itself. So it can be like URL, server names, file paths, um, some rules uh, in, in used in, in branching and looping and so on. So this is, as in uh, uh, software de development in general, this is a bad practice. Um, so the advice there is to, whenever you have a, 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 some kind of variable where, where it will be used and it's different in, in different environments, um, try to extract them uh, either into an orchestrator or to an Excel file and make it easy for the business users to manage and change them. So, an example could be, a, you know, like a configuration Excel file, which is stored on a document management system or a file system where they can easily come in and change the business rule without the need to actually uh, change the process and redeploy it to production again. So this will provide the flexibility and faster reaction to changes as well. It will uh, make it easier to actually roll out the process in production because you will just you know, change the configuration of the robot. Okay, so the next uh, item I want to talk about is uh, uh, how to actually present the information to business users. So the process owners uh, actually don't care how the process is technically implemented in the robot. So you might have like a process implemented, you know, business process implemented in like two, three different processes as a separate robot processes, but business users don't care how or why you implement it in such a way. And, you know, often orchestrators or products focus and display, you know, too much technical data and the business users really don't understand what went on. So our advice there is to try to implement some business user friendly uh, reporting and management interface where the user can like open a web page and, and see you know, what happened with this uh, specific uh, request. So where is it, in which status, when it was uh, received, uh, when it was completed, uh, and so on. So for this purpose, we, we use, uh, so, you know, different um, technologies or different mechanisms. So it can be something like simple SharePoint list where the robot enters and updates the information, or it can be a database report. So if you implement a custom uh, custom database, you can build a report on top of that and you can show this report to the to the customer. Uh, also, you can use uh, some kind of dashboards or such as Tableau, Power BI, ClickView, where you can expose information to the user in much more uh, simple way. So try to think about also how the process owners or management will actually uh, monitor and, 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 and report on the, on the on the processes executed by the robot. Um, so avoid the ping pong game. So um, what we've seen, you know, a lot of uh, blueprints for RPA teams 
you know, they have this distinctions between, you know, business analyst and RPA developer. And, you know, even, uh, even if this is a, a good thing in software development in general, I would say that in RPA, we, we uh, have this position that it should be blended into one role. Why? Because typically RPA is, uh, quite, has quite fast implementation cycles. So we are talking about weeks or maybe one, two, one or two months. So it doesn't make sense to actually have separated roles. Uh, so we, we are in position, we, we have this uh, uh, attitude that uh, we think that uh, you know, it makes sense to have one person, uh, one uh, single point of contact. So one person that can talk to the business users, process owners, implement the process and uh, deploy it to production. So this, um, uh, this has multiple benefits. So you have one single point of contact, one single point of uh, accountability or responsibility. You have much faster implementation because there's no communication friction between uh, business analyst and developer. So we've seen that over the years and uh, we use this tactic and it's uh, much, much, much more efficient. The downside of this uh, approach is that you, it's, it's a bit more, it's a bit harder to find these people because you need, you know, uh, people with more diversified skills. So meaning that you need a person that can actually talk to the business users, but also uh, has the, possesses the technical skills to actually uh, develop the process. Uh, next advice that I want to share is that um, when you are uh, in a niche or using a you know specific technology, there is a there is this tendency you know that you want to try solve all the problems using that technology. And RPA is not is not uh, you know um, anything different. So. We try to take this approach where we are not, we are uh, mostly focused on RPA, but we think of ourselves as automation consultants and we try to take a holistic view uh, on the process automation. So what we try to do is not only implement the process as is, we also try to optimize it as well, maybe remove some steps, uh, try to design it in a different way. So to get the optimal solution. So always try to think about, you know, I'm, the user said that, you know, the process is done in this way, try to challenge that and also try to, to see whether there's potential to actually change process or maybe to, to implement some other technology that will also help the robot do the work much more efficiently. Um, the next one is uh, regarding the, the process and the scope of the process. So when you talk to business users and they tell you about their process, they want to automate the process 100% of the cases that can happen uh, in that process. So they don't have to deal with it anymore. You know, they want to robot to take care of everything. But in, in most cases, this is a very dangerous promise to make because, you know, like 80% of, uh, of all the requests that, uh, you know, they, the, the, the business users do, they're like standard requests, but like 20% of them are specific cases that require, you know, specific things to be done. And there, um, you know, you would have to implement, you know, very, very big process. So if you try to do that, if you try to cover like all 100% of possible cases, you will end up with the Frankenstein process, very big process, which is hard to maintain, to change, to troubleshoot. It will have a very complex lo logic. Also, there will be a prolonged implementation because you know, um, you know, you will have to cover all these different cases and it will always requires some constant tweaking and changing because you know you will discover there's also this additional uh, case we didn't cover and you know so in the business case really doesn't uh, uh, you know justify this investment because these 20 percent of, of these uh, edge cases you know it doesn't make sense you know you will spend a lot of time and the, the benefits reaped from that automation will not you know um, will not uh, benefit the customer. So, so before actually diving into the implementation, when you are initially talking with the, with the business users, try to explain them the Pareto rule. Uh, so try to explain to them that, you know, with the robot, 80% of cases you will cover with the, with the robot and 20% of cases which 
appear, you know, very seldomly or very rarely, you know, still, you know, these cases would be forwarded to them as employees to, to fulfill. Uh, using this approach, you will, you will uh, lower the risks of implementation and you will have a better business case uh, for the roadmark. The problem with this uh, 20%, um, so to handle these 20%, to actually know that this is a specific case that you know robot will not cover and you need to actually forward that to an employee, you need to know about them, which means that uh, you, know, you have to talk a lot with the business users to actually uh, extract these uh, cases that can happen. And this is uh, very, you know, very tough because usually you're talking to people that are doing this process day in, day out. So it becomes their second nature. Uh, so they're actually not aware, you know, there are these specific cases. So you need to spend a lot of time actually uh, drilling them and to flushing out these possible exceptions and possible branches. And this is a very important part of the work in the, in the business analysis. So if you fail to actually you know, spend a lot of time with them and extract all the possible things, this will backfire uh, in production when you roll out the system. Okay, this one is really important and it, uh, it goes uh, 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 and it's about testing. So usually in the, when you're deploying robots, there are two phases uh, after you're finished with development. One is the testing and one is the hyper care. So before releasing to production, you test the process. And after you uh, release it to production, you have this hyper care period where you're stabilizing the robot. Um, so if you do not rigorously test your process, you will pay it in post-production or this hyper care period. And this is really one of the crucial advices in this uh, session. Uh, so if you fail to test it uh, properly, uh, you will pay it in hyper care, but it will come with the added tax. So it will put a lot of unnecessary stress on the people that are engaged in the implementation. So there will be some constant failures of robots. Uh, there will be, you know, need to fix it like uh, uh, promptly. Uh, also, you will lose credibility in front of the business users and the customer and the management because there will be often failures. So the robot is not working and so on and so um, so in the end, you will spend much more time actually fixing these things because you have to do it uh, in, in, in great rush. Uh, so you will spend much more time than in testing. So our advice there is actually really, really try to devote time to testing. You know, as in general software development, testing is always squeezed out. Like uh, when the time runs out, okay, we'll test it. Uh, you know, let's do it in just a couple of examples and it will work in production, no. So try to really test it thoroughly. And this requires tenacity, persuasion, uh, patience. So you need to actually persuade the business users to enter the data, to follow up on this thing. Uh, for us, uh, you know, it happened like we uh, entered like 2000 test cases and then on 2000, we discovered this, you know, unique thing that happens in production that was not visible before. So really try to spend a lot of time there because it will really save you credibility and it will be much less stressful. Um, so the next advice is when uh, is regarding the, the, the delivery method of RPA projects. So with the uh, COVID uh, pandemic, so it became like new normal. So you can deliver uh, projects uh, uh, online but actually the best results are uh, uh, achieved in on-site engagement. Um, and this is really especially important during a business analysis and testing and production rollout. Um, it's just when you're present there with the business users, um, you can really, uh, they're there, they're focused on that work and you are focused on that work as well. So it can really help because you can really communicate really fast you can uh, tackle any challenges and so on. So we would really recommend if there's a possibility to actually deliver projects uh, on site. Also for the visibility of the projects, one of the things that uh, we've actually seen is that uh, 
It's a good practice actually because we are talking about robots, but not real robots, they are software robots, but people have tendency uh, to actually give it a name. So uh, use that fact actually to, 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 to give this to RPA initiative to give a human name. So here you can see on a picture, we were doing a project for a bank. And so they gave the name to the robot Roberto and they actually made the mascot uh, for this robot. So you can do like internal marketing campaign and events that actually, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, promote this technology and actually achieve visibility within the company. So you will get the visibility, you will get awareness of the people. You will actually remove some of the fears that people have, like, will they use, uh, will they lose jobs and, and what the robot is actually doing and how it's working. And it will also help you gather new process candidates and actually deploy the technology in much more uh, scale. Um, also, one thing is uh, when you start to scale in, in terms of uh, number of robots, um, then change management becomes a really uh, a topic because you know, if a certain application changes, that can uh, have an impact on, on a number of robots or uh, processes. And you need to kind of also manage these changes so it's important when you start scaling that you come to an agreement with the IT and all other stakeholders uh, that they actually communicate these changes to you upfront. So, uh, so that they say, you know, next week we will have a new rollout of this application or SAP or whatever, so that you have time to actually test these changes and assess the impact that it will have uh, on your deployment. Also, when, coming, uh, when talking about the deployment, one thing that we actually uh, implement is that we use deployment checklists. Uh, so it's kind of a checklist where you actually uh, have a list of things that you need to do in order to process to run. So what are the applications that need to be installed versions? Where are the files stored? What are some network ports, firewall permissions and so on? So this is a, a ch checklist that actually um, helps you move the robot in production. And also when adding new robots, it will also uh, help you deploy them. So, it, and it's be best done while it's still fresh in your memory. So before the actual uh, production. So this will actually uh, decrease the stress and it will also, uh, you know, avoid the situation, you know, that you forget something when you actually roll out to production and the robot is not working and you cannot really understand why it's not working. Um, so to end this presentation, um, um, so a lot of focus is actually put on the picking the technology instead of picking the right people or a partner, implementing partner. So I would say, I would argue that skilled and experienced consultants can actually deliver excellent projects using any tool that you can find from the Gartner or any other analyst uh, report. Um, because, you know, uh, as we, as we talk to this presentation, you know, a skilled consultant or a skilled employee would implement the system in such a way that, you know, it's, it's, it's maintainable, it's understandable, it has, you know, these uh, business interfaces, so the business users are satisfied. And this all really depends on the skill and the experience of the people. Uh, so I would say, you know, when considering technology, also try to think about, you know, the people uh, try to think about, you know, make sure that team members that are in the proposal that you get from the implementing partner, that they are actually the ones that will be engaged in the pro project. Also, uh, when you uh, have the proposal for, from brand names like big uh, IT and, and business consulting companies, that ne doesn't necessarily uh, guarantee quality. Uh, because, you know, it can be a team that is assembled from all over the world and it doesn't really guarantee you know the quality of the project um, so focus on the people references not company reference so if you have a, a proposal and you know they have like big brand names as references it doesn't mean that the people that uh, implemented these references are still with the company so try to focus more on the on the people rather than on the uh, company and also try to read the proposal in detail, not just a commercial summary. So customers often tend to focus on the commercial side, but also try to really understand how they envision the, pro the pro project, you know, how they think about the processes and the technology. 
and also verify the satisfaction of their customer base. So try to have some reference calls with the customers they mentioned as references. And in, try to interview the team members as well that will be engaged on the, on the project. Um, so that's all from my side. Um, also, I would like to invite you to uh, uh, join me in the speakers lounge if you have any questions so we can discuss about it. Also, uh, this is my email. So if you have any comments or questions, also feel free uh, to contact me there. Thank you very much.